Coming to you live from the School of Information Studies at Syracuse University. Our guest today is Michael Brown, CEO and Chairman of the Board at Skyline Robotics. His role, Michael serves as both a veteran strategic advisor and is leading the expansion of Skyline into the U.S. market. Michael's 35-year career has focused on business services, distributions, and roll-ups. He has led two previous companies and with revenue over $400 million, both of which were sold publicly, uh, sold to publicly traded companies. During Michael's career, the companies he has led have generated in excess of five billion while leveraging a proven model, driving growth and market expansion through business acquisition, cross-selling and organic growth, steeped in data analysis and strategy. Additionally, Michael serves, as, uh, serves on the Sanitation Foundation's Board of Directors, the official nonprofit partner of the New York City Department of Sanitation. Michael holds a degree in information technology from Syracuse University. And I'd like to welcome you, Michael. Hey, Mike, thanks for having me. Anytime, anytime. It's great to have you here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about where you are now, Skyland Robotics, and um, how the idea for the company uh, came to be? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm based out of New York City, uh, live on the Upper East Side, and um, work out of Manhattan mostly. Um, and after I sold my last business, uh, I had signed the seven year non-compete and being in the service distribution business for 30 plus years needed to find that new, uh, something new. And most of the things that I've done in my past is, have been disruptive technologies, um, bringing it to more from a commodity standpoint. Um, and I liked robotics. And originally I was looking at um, the healthcare industry for um, elderly patients, um, for like their robot assistants. Um, but uh, I saw the opportunity one day when I was driving down the West Side Highway looking at skyscrapers and said, I can't believe people are still cleaning skyscrapers by hand. So I found Skyline Robotics, uh, and from there, I started in uh, December of 20. That's awesome, and such a great idea. You know, um, you think about potentially hazardous jobs and, and jobs where there aren't as many people doing them anymore, and window washing is probably right up there. Yeah, so it's, it's right up there is, is right. It's that dirty, dull, dangerous job. Um, very, uh, when you look in the United States, 76% are over the age of 40 in the industry with only, I want to say 9% under the age of 30. And when you look at growth in buildings being built over the last 10 years, it's only grown by, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 times in very large skyscrapers. And when you look at uh, just in New York City, I want to say there used to be 1,300 window washers in the union. Today, there's probably less than 500. So it's just a, it, it, it's, it's a very difficult job. It's very dangerous. Um, and there are just a lot better, you know, job offerings out there than to be you know, out in, in 120 degree weather getting, you know, hit on by sun or rain or, you know, and wind. And it, it, it's a real, it's a very tough job to have. That's awesome. Um, you've led several companies and you were named one of the world's most inspiring leaders in 2023 in World Leaders Magazine. Um, what have you learned a bit about leadership since you began your career? <sighs> I think leadership has um, a couple different spokes. So one, I think that you need to practice what you preach. Uh, I think you need to be, people are going to look towards you on how you're behaving to see how they behave. 
Um, and so I, I would say that's one big issue. And I would say the other biggest is listening. Um, you know, un- recognizing that your people are your number one asset. And if you listen, um, you're going to get better, a better culture um, and more of a consensus. Uh, so the leadership becomes more, less, it becomes less than one individual and it becomes more spread out. That makes a lot of sense. Um, on, on that, what advice would you give new graduates um, as far as if they want to lead a company? So, I, you know, if you want to lead your own company, you have to have that entrepreneurial spirit, right? So, and with that comes, how do you raise capital to put that together and, and, and so forth? Um, but I think that early on, there are great companies to go to that have some really good programs in the, in your early years to give you the basics of what the expectations are in the work environment, how to navigate, you know, understanding managers and, you know, you want to get at least some sort of structure in your past, because when you just go 100%, you know, entrepreneur, there's usually a lot of different problems you create that had you had the called one to two year experience, you would not have those issues. No, that makes a ton of sense. Being able to, if I can unpack that, being able to sort of learn from a culture or any culture, right? sort of helps you become a better leader because you've seen how things have been done, good or bad. Exactly. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I see a lot of student entrepreneurs, and that's one of the things I think. They're, they're never short on ideas, um, but it, it's it's knowing how things work and, and working somewhere else and seeing how um, the sausage gets made. Well, 100%. And one of the biggest opportunities for people, in, in, in let's say, that have the experience is going into these companies that have young entrepreneurs that have come up with phenomenal ideas, but don't know how to get it to market, that don't know how to put it together, that don't know how to focus and everything else. And for me, what we brought in to this already, you know, existing company that was basically in fairness insolvent, but had great ideas, but never, it never, they, it was a prototype never commercialized and anything. So until we came in and said, okay, hey, listen, here's how you run a business. They were really, you know, I would say wild with their ideas. So you came in and like kind of reined it in. It was almost like a turnaround. It was almost like a turnaround. It was, you know, and and I got, I don't want to say lucky, but from a timing standpoint, I happened to sell a business. I was looking for another business. You know, a lot of things moved in the right direction to get me to where I was. And I saw that these were two young individuals that had great ideas. And I thought it was a lo- much further along because I didn't even understand the technology. Um but what I found literally in the first 90 days uh, as a team with what was there, I mean, the company had raised, I want to say, $3 million at the time, and we found $250,000 in double payments and things. I mean, like just basic stuff. So 10%, so, so if you, if 10% of your money is basically unaccounted for, what else are you going to find? So that has been a, a real big um, plus to for the company because it went from a an idea prototype and someone that's uh, you know has management experience has come in and has been able to at least you know shore it up. That's pretty neat. Um, 
I'm going to pivot a little bit and ask you another question. Um, being a leader is hard, right? We, you have to deal with different personality types. You have to figure out how to motivate and, and inspire. Can you share some wisdom with us? Yeah, you know, first of all, I try to, like I said, lead by example. Um, in my role today, I'm more of, I don't want to say a cheerleader, but our company is separated by R&D and by a, a, a business that's being built out at, in an ecosystem that doesn't exist. So for me, the education that I'm providing to all the employees that are in R&D, just about what's going on on the business side, they very much are, are into that. At the same time, um, to motivate, it, first of all, I always think you have to have a positive attitude if you're leading. Um, I think that yelling at people and belittling people um, is just not right. Uh, I'm into respect. Um, and I'm not into the pyramid type of managing. So I like flat organizations. I like to surround myself with subject matter experts in their area and know that they know more than I do and feel comfortable that they are getting this, the job done that needs to get done and that I can look at all the pieces together and, and try to manage it from that standpoint. And sometimes, you know, at certain points in people's lives, they need different types of motivation and different types of inspiration. You know, people that are not at work do have a, another life, right? They have a family, they have friends, they have problems, doctors and, and everything else. And I think that if you can be supportive, I think that is one of the greatest, you know, self motivations for the other to be like, wow, I don't want to disappoint X because they're invested in me, not just as an employee, but as a person. You know, that's, that's a, I, I love, I love everything you're saying here because you're spending about a third of your life um, at a place of employment. Right. And so working, working for someone who thinks that way and um, has respect for people's things going on outside of time, but also gives them the opportunity to sort of see how they fit within the organization. Right. And it's, it's all about everybody kind of working together to achieve a common goal. I mean, it's a, that's a really great way to think about leadership. Yeah. And it's tough to build that culture. Right. And, you know, in my previous businesses, when you have acquisitions as roll-ups, having your core culprit culture that you've created to try, if it's the right culture, to try to disseminate to those satellite offices so they can feel it. Because every time people would come visit us in our corporate offices, everyone was like, oh, I wish I was working here. It's so much, I mean, all the action and, and, and everything else. So uh, it, it's... It, it's it's not easy to do, um, but I think that if you start at the top, it's got a great way of making its way all the way through to the bottom. Can I ask you one of these uh, these really? Um, there, I I think it's a funny question, but like, what is most important to be successful in your career? You know, what do you what do you feel is the most important characteristic or aspect or skill? I have to, I, I think you have to be a people person. And I think that there is tremendous opportunity given where technology has gone today that, you know, we used to have a very, you used to know someone by voice, right? You used to talk on a phone, you knew their voice and whatever. Then video conferencing came out. They're like, oh my God, that's the greatest thing. Now, I don't have any business calls unless it is via video, right? So what's happened is that's replaced the 
personal interaction where that you'd have meetings and, and so forth, which has now created a whole different dynamic. So I believe that personal relationships in business is essential for success because you cannot depend on technology. Yes. If you're running a SaaS business and you know, you're, it's, it's, you're selling licenses, of course, that the revenue is going to grow there. But trust me, the person that is making the deals on the other side, that's what's, you know, most important. Another sentiment that I'm happy to hear, Michael, because, uh, you know, that's what we try to preach here at the iSchool is, right? It's not just about the technology, right? It's very much about people and your interactions with people and getting to know, um, getting to know the people you're work with, working with, getting to know your clients, right? Getting to know your customers, right? Understanding technology is an end to a means, right? Like your technology washes windows, right? And that's the, that's the, that's the means. But how you achieve the means um, in, involves a lot of interactions with people. Yeah, and by the way, when you're when you're the leader of the business, and it matters what type of businesses you are, you know, usually you're the leader in an entrepreneurial business is always the salesperson, and you know, and and is the driving visionary. Um, but when you have what I would call mature businesses. And businesses that um, have been around for many, many, many years, the leaders are not running the business. The leaders are focused on so many other things that they don't even get to really focus on the business. You know, they're dealing with finance. They're dealing with, you know, human resources, which is a huge, you know, undertaking. And it's dealing with banks and, and things of that nature. So, you know, being a leader is a, a, a tough situation because people are looking towards you. And if you don't have people that are leading on a daily basis, then you leave yourself a gap. So, you know, it, it's being able to delegate leadership out, making sure you, you have people that understand what's needed. Um, and it's just taking, you know, uh, uh, in fairness, I've been doing this for 30 plus years. I've been around it my whole life with my father. So I, I got a very good education as it relates to running a business. So, you know, having a long career like that, can you look back and tell us what your proudest accomplishment of your career has been? I would definitely have to say um, the Allied, uh, comp the company that we had was Allied, which was sold to Office Depot in 2006. Um, that company went through one of the most incredible transitions and turnarounds during crazy times in life. Uh, it was uh, 1998, the company uh, started and day one, it was 12 companies being purchased all together that then had to be put together, that then had to have cultures put together and, and all these other things. And that was during the dot-com boom and people couldn't get employees. And then you had 9-11 happen and then you had, you know, this mass uh, recession and, you know, I went from 1,300 employees down to 700 employees in a mat to just make it because I was business in New York. So, you know, I, there have for me and then to be able to exit out of the company from a shareholder standpoint, that was the greatest turnaround for the shareholders standpoint. From an educational standpoint, what I learned was after the company was sold in 06 to Office Depot, and Office Depot basically dismantled and destroyed the company literally in, in less than six months, was how impacted the employees were by their culture being changed and 
now going under this completely different type of management that they didn't want to work for. And what I really have seen is I enjoy building and creating and continuing business. I'm not always looking to just make the quick buck and, you know, and sell it because you live through, I mean, you can imagine that my company is based out of Israel. You can imagine what's going on there for the past eight months with 12 employees being in, in the middle of the war and mentally and being able to support the families and so forth. So even with all my experience that I had with 9-11, trying to deal with that and hurricanes and other catastrophes, I never, ever had anyone working for me that's been in a war. Um, and that has changed my whole outlook on uh, life. Uh, so it's a learning experience every year that, you know, we continue. So in other words, 35 years, you're still learning. Right. Oh, every day, okay. every That's day, it. because, because listen, life changes rapidly, right? And every day you're going to wake up every day, there's a new problem thrown at you and you got to figure it out. So, you know, if you're, if, if you're not dealing with solving solutions, you're, you're usually just standing still. So how, do you, how important do you feel um, networking is in your career? And do you have any networking advice for, for students? So networking is probably one of the most important things out there. And it's not just business. You know, people, especially when you're young, and I'll never forget uh, what my father used to tell me all the time when I was younger – I used to, I was playing soccer all the time and I played a little golf and I was, you know, I could hit the ball really far and show signs of greatness. And he said, listen, when you get in business, if you think you're going to call up Joe and say, Joe, let's go down to the park and go kick the soccer ball around and you're going to scream across the way, hey, how's business? He's like, that's not going to happen. He's like, The way it's going to happen is you need to go out there, get in the, go figure out how to get better at golf. He's like, and then everyone's going to want to play with you. He's like, and then in business, you'll see that the most important people are going to want to play with the best golfers. He's like, so don't go to soccer, go learn how to play golf. Um, Great. It was a great life lesson. I mean, I'm not saying that everyone needs to go play, play golf, But it is the opportunities in college, for instance, right? Everyone that you are leaving from basically is pretty Northeast, uh, you you know, surrounded. I mean, I walk down the street. I see people that I went to Syracuse with all the time. And I still see see people that graduated ahead of me, people that uh, graduated that are younger than me. And Syracuse, especially in the Northeast, is just, it's a, it's a great community. So it's very easy to network. People want to be helpful. I mean, one of the great things about a LinkedIn that the students will learn as they get older is that just having that, you know, where I'm from Syracuse, you're from Syracuse, you get a little bit of a, a, a thread and a, a look at like, hey, I'm from Syracuse. I got a question. I'm looking for help. As long as you're not like cold calling them and, and, and so forth, I think that they're going to be of help. But it's who you know in this world that's going to get things done. And that's in medical, that's in schools, that's in business, that's life. And it's just the reality. You, you mentioned LinkedIn. Can you, you want to talk a little bit about LinkedIn? I mean, you and I are from the generation pre-LinkedIn, right? Yeah. Um, when our networking was a lot different. So let's talk a bit about LinkedIn. 
So LinkedIn is a phenomenal tool. Um, different people use it. Uh, different professionals that I uh, that I work with that use it differently. But basically, it is probably the largest business repository of contacts where people keep it to business, um, more or less. And it is, people are very open to being able to communicate to get to the right person in an organization. And I find that to be uh, LinkedIn to be essential in my daily routine. Uh, I'm getting, I don't know, somewhere between eight to nine requests a day. Um, and I would say probably 10% of them are, can be worthwhile for what I'm interested in. Um, but you know, marketing companies, they love it. Uh, you know, you need to cold call. Great. Uh, you need to figure out, you know, who's in an industry and who the competitors are and, and so forth. Also, uh, really a powerful tool. So, um, going back to new students for a bit and new, um, students going out there looking for jobs. Um, what do you look for in a new hire? And um, maybe you could talk a little bit about advice for negotiating that first salary. Yeah. So in when you're coming out of college, right, unless you're going to be in a, a specialized field, um, unfortunately, there's not much negotiating that's going to happen, right? You're going to walk in and let's say you're going to be a salesperson. Right. And they're going to pay you a base salary, maybe some commissions. The window of negotiation, they might have, you know, some leeway of 5%. You know, it's a fit, could be an $80,000 job. Maybe they could play with 82, 82.5. But um, so, one, I don't know that you really need to be able to negotiate a deal. However, I do believe that you need to be open about if, you know, let's say you're someone that wants to travel during the summer, you know, it's something to say, hey, during the summer, I usually go hiking in the Adirondacks for two weeks. Is that going to be a problem in the future? I don't want it to be. So that that's like a great opportunity. I think people listening interacting, asking um, interesting business questions to what the business is doing, um, I, I think can be engaging. Uh, but I, but in, in fairness, when you're coming out of college, it's kind of like cookie cutter, unless you're going to go try to start something on your own. And it's not a bad thing to go right into cookie cutter because cookie cutter gives you the tools to at least know what, you know, what to do when you go to an office in the future. No, that's very fair. Um, and I think that's great advice as well. So you're, you're, um, you're, you're an high school alum. You, you're a, what, a third or fourth generation SU um, alum? I'm a third generation. My son's a fourth. Your favorite. son's a fourth. So how do you feel Syracuse has impacted your family and your career? Syracuse has been a part of my life since I was born. So um, I knew I was going to go there when I, I was growing up. Um, it wasn't like it was forced on me, but I was kind of like, hey, I don't know. Should be pretty easy to get in third generation Everyone says it's an unbelievable great school. Sign me up. I'll be great. Um, my grandfather was a townie um, at Syracuse. He wound up getting two degrees uh, from Syracuse. My father got his degree. I got my degree. And then there's like, I want to say, 
nine other family members that have also gone, whether it be cousins or nieces or nephews, um, were there a, a, a lot. Um, the We always did business in Syracuse as well. Um, when we were in the distribution business, so we did business with the school, so we'd always been around. Um, and now with uh, my new business with Skyline, I've been getting involved in a, in a different way because with artificial intelligence and regulations and uh, there's a company, JMA Wireless, you know, the, the dome. Um, so there's a lot going on in my world that I'm trying to build today with Syracuse because with Micron Technologies coming and with a lot of hopefully other businesses now going to support Micron, I think there's a huge uh, opportunity for Syracuse over the next five, 10 years where if I can develop a program and I can get, you know, people that can learn how to robotics and artificial intelligence and machine learning and algorithms. Now, all of a sudden I see that. So that's what I'm trying to put together now. I just need the business to like, you know, get there. And then, um, but I'm, I'm laying down the groundwork uh, and I'd love to do something with the school. That's pretty neat. Um, can I ask you a question a, a bit about, um, the robots that you're using, are they semi-autonomous or are they autonomous? Uh, do you just put them up our, on a scaffold and they just... Ro our robots are 100% autonomous. Um, they are calculating their speed, to it, their movements 250 times every second. Um, and in our business, differently than a regular robotic business, so a regular robot, you program to do a certain set of tasks and, and so forth. In our world, we can't program it to do any tasks because it's sitting there and it's in a totally unstable environment. Um, so what we do is we teach it to learn and react as fast as humanly possible. Um which is pretty cool. And when you're at, you know, when you're hundreds of meters in the air or thousands of feet in the air, you, you want to make sure that that uh, is being calculated correctly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that's pretty cool. That's very interesting because, you know, that brings up a lot of science that we uh, teach in the high school um, well, listen, about, about how to use do AI and apply AI. So, and it's not just that it's, we are, using LIDAR technology to scan the buildings. We're not pre-scanning the building, so it just goes right to the building. LIDAR technologies looking at through transparent windows, but being able to pick up all the sills. Then we use sonic uh, waves to make sure that the, it doesn't crash into the building. And it's, yeah, there's so many cool different things between um, the communications, you know, you've got rivers and rivers of frequencies in big cities. So how do you noise filter out and keep stable communications 300 meters so you can pass data real time? Yeah. I imagine an early problem was like, uh, <laughs> an early problem was probably, whoops, you're actually cleaning the brick. You're not cleaning the glass. <laughs> right. No. And, and, and then, you know, and our business is really moving from, uh, what I would call window washing into data collection and, and how do you, and how do you give the health of the facade and, you know, what's that building look like and what ESG um, initiatives can you be after when you've got HVAC leaks and water infiltration? Yeah, that's, that's really neat. And that's, um, I think very common when, when you enter into an industry, right? You're like, you think differently than the human replacement, right? The human replacement, they go up there, they wash the windows, they come down, right? But now when you have a robot out there with all these sensors on it, it can also detect other potential problems and issues with the building. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But it, but the good news is we work with the union um, 
so that it becomes more of a collaborative service because you're still always going to need humans, but they're going to be more in what I'll call detailed work than what I would say the 90% bulk of the building that just needs, you know, it's basic stuff. It's not getting in the nooks and crannies and, you know, and, and polishing the knobs. That's awesome. That caters to the, the cobot idea, right? Where the future of work involves robots helping people do their jobs better and more efficiently and taking away the tasks that just aren't, um, maybe, yeah. maybe are more menial. Yeah. I mean, the cobot, the cobot's, biggest function is to make sure that it doesn't run over a human. Um, so it's got this exoskeleton on it that basically when it touches, it just, it fails or it stops immediately. We had to actually build uh, our industrial robot because there are humans uh, around the scaffolding. We actually had to create a waterproof um, air skin. The company's it's called an air skin so that the industrial robot can act as a coba. Pretty That's cool. That's pretty neat. It's another thing that I didn't know that I needed to figure out that we needed to figure out when we got in this business. So I'm going to um, leave with this last question. Uh, you've been asked to be our convocation speaker and you've agreed. And is it, Maybe, can you offer us a sneak peek about what you're going to say at Convocation without giving it all away? Yeah, I mean, listen, there, there's nothing revolutionary that I'm going to say, but what I am going to talk about is your personal ecosystem um, and how important it is to, and when you talk about networking, but your personal ecosystem for family, friends, business, and making sure that you're always called looking at it and saying, am I aligned? Are these people aligned with where I want to go? Are they not aligned? And it's not that you have to get rid of people, but what you can do is you can segment, right? And you can put them in your, call your world, like my college friends. I have Many, 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 many college friends. However, I have five college friends that I speak to on a regular basis, and I put them in a different category, and I speak to them on a infrequent basis, but I can pick up a conversation like it was yesterday because they have the, the history. So learning how to surround yourself with people that are going to help you get things done and move your life forward, to me, is the most critical point. Because if you surround yourself with, and the right people doesn't mean celebrities or rich or poor, it, it's just for, for what you're trying to accomplish, you should always just be looking at, are these people aligned? You know, people grow up, other people don't. I have friends from college that when, you know, when you turn 50, like you kind of like, kind of like start acting a certain way, right? And you can't be jumping off things and, you know, acting like an idiot. So those people, while they're, of course, my friends, I'm not going to be socializing with them as much. So, you know, it, it, it's always looking into, because... You are the most, as an individual, your own personal ecosystem is the greatest asset that you can have for yourself. And then you want to pass it on to your children and have them learn and build. And so, yeah, that's really what I'm going to talk about is really just how important it is to surround yourself with people so that you can get there because you can't ever do it alone. I chuckled through that story because you, you took me back to college. You really did. I have I have my circle of college friends that I still relate to. I have a, a smaller circle of college friends where I'm like, are you ever going to grow up? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's funny. It's funny. Yeah. And, and listen, and relationships, and that's, you know, like I was talking about, technology is great. Technology should make life easier. Technology should make life 
safer and, and, and should provide you with great information so you make great decisions based on facts. However, you as an individual need human interaction and need relationships to be able to live and be happy. I've never met, I've never met a happy uh, loner in my life. And as you and I both know, the technology will change. And um, so you just cannot, you can't put your eggs in the technology basket because it's always going to change. It's always going to be different and you're, you're going to have to adapt. You have to pivot. And if, if your plan, you have long-term plans, right? But if you're what I call, when we do a budget in the beginning of the year, Trust me, there's a second version and then there's a third version throughout the year because things change so quickly in today's age. You know, it, 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 it's look, just look at the iPhone, what they what they keep doing every year. You got to change your cable. So, so true. So true. Well, I, I thank you very much for your time. I'm looking forward to your convocation speech um, next week. And uh, thank you, Michael Brown. And um, this is a wrap. Hey, Mike. Great time. Thanks again. Really appreciate it. Go Cubes.